Okay, let's go ahead. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. I think this is a, an important evening I'd like to spend with you to talk about some fundamental issues. Uh, first of all, the good thing is I'm, you know, I'm a little better spirits than I was last week. I, I, well, I guess I missed last week. The week before, I had just gotten out of jail. So I was little, somebody commented on my video that I seemed a little bit down and uh, I don't know, I forget now what the word was, uh, uh, somber or something like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, so I'm not feeling that this way, the way that way this week. So um, it's good to be with you. Um, so tonight I want to talk about Mises's liberalism from 1927. Set up the 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 thesis, the idea, and I think most importantly, and it's not possible to read this book without understanding this, the historical context and what it says about Mises, and and his times, and in turn, what it says about us and our people who love liberty and the temperament that we should have. I'm getting a notification here, one moment. Okay, good, you can hear me all right. It's not the best connection, but it'll be fine for now. And, and in any case, what this book says about our attitude uh, towards the world. I'm not saying that I have it perfect, uh, you know, to be a liberal in all times and all places, a liberal meaning libertarian. Uh, I, I like the term liberal, by the way. I think I think it's the right term for us, whether you're libertarian or limited government or <coughs> Minarchist Hayeki and, you know, Bastia guy, Thomas Jefferson, constitutionalist, doesn't matter. Uh, liberal is a particular thing. It's a particular set of ideals. It's a temperament. It's an outlook. It's an ambition. It's a dream. I think it's the right word. So I'm just going to continue to use the word liberal here tonight uh, to describe that. We can defend, I'll defend that some other time. <clears throat> but I think it's a real thing and it's something we should aspire to. One of the reasons it's very difficult is that in so many ways, liberalism dwells, dwells in the realm of ideas. It's, it's an abstraction. It's not something you can see and touch. It's it's a it's an ambition for the long term for 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 the whole community of humanity to thrive, um, and to have that as an ideal is in in uh, highly politicized times like ours is very difficult, because you think about who are our opponents. You know, um, on the one hand, on the left, uh, they don't think in terms of of, of abstract ideals of of the of the good of good of the whole, of uh, the long term. It's only about who can get what kind of material property right now from whom. Who has too much? Who has too little? Does have a state that kind of resolves this problem? You know, gives takes from one, gives to the other. Uh, dealing with very concrete problems with very, you know, sort of uh, concrete but ultimately violent solutions. Um, but it, but it's more immediate. It's it's something that penetrates the brain. I mean, quite frankly, it, it appeals to, to people without a lot of imagination, you know, um, uh, without a, a, a sense of abstraction, you know, where people who don't bother to take, above all, don't take the time to learn anything about economics, who, who can't juggle uh, uh, abstract thoughts in their head and can't follow down two steps of logic, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a brutal and, and um, uh, materialist philosophy of life. That that just calculates, you know, according to who owns what and and how it can be better uh, better distributed, essentially, without a thought to production, without a thought to the long term. Um, an extremely annoying and troubling point of view, but it's got a lot of advantages, as we can see today in the political world. People chase this doctor around. I look at look at uh, Bernie Sanders and and how popular he is. Uh, just because he appeals to this very sort of base nature. On the other hand, you have the right, what I'm going to call the right, uh, that similarly uh, dispenses with, with uh, uh, big ideals of human flourishing, um, human well-being, uh, the welfare of all the long term. No, it's for the right. It's all about my religion, yeah? my blood, you know, my race, my people, my nation, uh, patriotism. Uh, you know, military uh, victories, authority, uh, who's doing the wrong thing and how can we get them to stop? How, who's doing the right thing and how can we reward them? Both of them, both left and right, right deal this way. This is the, their currency. So liberalism is, is something different because it uh, deals with, 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 with things that are, that are intangible, at least, um, at, least, at least for now. 
um, we're dealing with 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 a future unseen, with a, a kind of a peace unrealized, with the prosperity we're not experiencing, but which is possible under the right institutional circumstances. Liberalism, uh, at least in Mises' conception, is a result of a, of a, of a more scientific uh, mind, a higher intelligence, a, uh, a, a getting rid of base considerations of faith and blood and and uh, uh, you know. Uh, things like uh, who owns what and and how can we make it more, more fair like children it gets rid of all that so this is a problem for liberalism it always has been um in 1927 the world was going into upheaval you know in terms of mises's own intellectual development he had um uh his first book was on on money he wrote in, in 1912. His second book was, was uh, how war had changed uh, the landscape of, 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 of the world, the political landscape, the age of democracy, and what would be required. It was, it was, it was a, a tribute to liber uh, liberalism, but he took many aspects of liberalism for granted in that book. Um, then in 1922, he dealt with the what he saw as the fundamental threat to the world. Um, especially in light of the Bolshevik Revolution uh, and the rise of, of socialist movements all over Europe, and especially in academia, right? I mean, he's he's like working in Austria. Every single professor was like a socialist, you know, and that's what that's what sort of what they dealt with. That's what they did. So he wrote this book, Socialism, which is primarily an attack on on um, what today we call left socialism or, 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 or communism or left-wing ideology, essentially, um, which you saw as the primary threat to the world. I mean, and many in the U.S. would have agreed. In the 1920s, we saw the Red Scare. Uh, all over Europe, uh, there was tremendous terror and fear of, of, of communism coming, uh, doing to Europe what uh, the Bolsheviks did to Russia. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the threat was certainly exaggerated in the U.S., uh, there's a difference between like, I mean, do we justly fear communism? Yes, absolutely. Is it communism actually a prospect, actually a possibility? Probably not, you know. Um, it might have been more real in, in, in uh, Mises' time in Europe than it, than it ever was in the U.S., but nonetheless, this was his main focus in 1922, that, that sort of um, uh, uh, collective ownership, common ownership or state ownership of, of all um, industry and uh, equalization of property and along with with that went a lot of really harebrained stuff from 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 the writings of marx you know the great god of the time uh such as uh, 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 the elimination of the family the abolition of religion as we know that marx had a just a wild uh, opposition to religion and um you know as a as a thing that was inhibiting the the advancement of communism in the world and um, you know, 100% uh, inheritance tax, and you know these sorts of things, uh, centralized control of of, of uh, uh, money, uh, you know, just a kind of a, a an egalitarianism that didn't seem to recognize the uh, didn't didn't seem to didn't seem to recognize that there are certain things that people love in this world. I mean, one is their faith, the other is a property, you know, and and that freedom is to be valued. Uh, Marxism, as it, as it came to emerge in, in Europe, didn't have any regard for any of that stuff. So it was a, a terrifying ideology, and his book Socialism hammered it, explaining that this is a, a system that couldn't work. In fact, what it would do is completely break down civilization as we know it. But, you know, this remained his focus. Um, in the mid middle of the 1920s, he wrote a book, Attacking Interventionism, which he regarded as being um, you know, a system of, of, of control, mainly price control, wage control, administrative edicts that were coming down from, from states all over the world to uh, interfere in people's freedom to, to trade. Not socialism as such, but what he called interventionism, which is alive everywhere in the world. Everything from the manipulation of money and credit um, to um, uh, speech controls and, and wage controls and price controls. Um, regulatory interventions, creation of cart business cartels, um, not socialism as such, um, but interventionism. At that point in history, it didn't really have a name. There were things like Nazi parties and, and uh, that sort of thing in, in Germany, uh, 
but uh, they had not yet achieved any kind of political success. That was that was to come a little bit later. Um, by 1927, it became obvious to me just that things were uh, in in a meltdown, uh, especially in Europe. You know, we'd already seen the great German inflation. Uh, there are two great com competitors for for political control rising in Europe: the socialists on the one hand, uh, the fascists on the other. Uh, uh, you can call them the red shirts versus the brown shirts. Both of them socialists of sort, but um, one uh, accepting the the old left wing creed, you know, of the abolition of the of the family, which is a fundamental attack on on religion going on there, uh, a, a, a rampant egalitarianism. That aspired for um, equalization of of, of 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 results, you know, and, and property and that sort of thing. The right wing version uh, took on a different cast, a different ideological structure, and it must have been between somewhere between um, when Mises finished his book 19, uh, Socialism, nineteen twenty two, and the writing of this book in nineteen twenty seven, which directly attacks fascism, as far as I can tell, for the first time, um, that we started to see this ideology cohere. Uh, this brown shirted ideology go here and and Mises has a, an explicit attack on it. You can turn to the chapterism here and see that I, I I'm not aware of any other book that that makes such a, a, a brutal attack on fascism this early it's in 1927 okay and he names it um, he he calls it uh, uh, you know the appearance of, of capitalism without the reality. Uh, uh, talks about just the inefficiencies associated with the creation of business, business cartels, um, migration controls, protectionism, trade protectionism was, was central. He says if, in this chapter on fascism that if fascism were to um, triumph, that civilization would be destroyed just as surely as it would be under socialism. He does add one caveat, and it's just one or two sentences in here, where he says... Um, that Mussolini, for, for you know, for for all of his problems, you know, as a syndicalist, socialist, uh, fascist, he, he, the the one good thing he could say about the fascists is that they were opposed to the communists, and that whenever they won victories, they actually uh, crushed the communists, which he thought was actually, I mean, crushed politically, which he thought was actually a good thing. So he said, in in a sense, sense and it, even there's an element of irony here. He says, you know, the world owes. Uh, Mussolini a debt of gratitude for having saved uh, Italy from the communists. Well, wouldn't you know it, right? I mean, all, all the, for ever since this book came out in 1927, the left has seized on that one sentence in this book as if it's the only thing he ever wrote or only thing he ever said about fascism and tried to portray Mises as a fascist. It's, it's a deeply dishonest trick and it's, it's, it's a bloody outrage, but they never stop doing it. I mean, for all I know, I'm going to open up Slate tomorrow morning and there'll be an attack on Mises for this one sentence, you know? And keep in mind, too, this is before the horrors of, of fascism had revealed themselves in, in the 1930s and, and long before, um, you know, Hitler took, uh, took power. So, you know, th this whole chapter is unbelievably prescient and, and, and viciously critical of fascism, but, you know, the, the left seizes on one sentence and tries to portray it otherwise. Uh, it's just disgusting. I mean, just really a measure of the dishonesty of Mises' critics here. Um, in any case, the, so 19, you know, this, this book, 1927, uh, liberalism, what it attempts to do is, is recapture an old creed, a creed from the age of laissez-faire, which Mises dates from the end of the Napoleonic Wars all the way to World War I. So we had largely for the most part of the 19th century in Europe, but also in the U.S., with the exception of slavery and trade protectionism um, and the Civil War. Um, it's, it's what's considered to be, to be the age of laissez-faire. Now long gone. World War I got rid of it. it. It introduced a planning state all over the world and vanquished the ideals of liberalism. Um, Mises was called the last night of liberalism for the reason, because it was kind of the last book. Uh, and people regarded it as that, like, oh, here's this old-timey guy writing about the system that's long over. Doesn't he know that now uh, there is no... There is a choice. We have to. There's either communism or, or, or fascism. Well, as a fair mercantilism, uh, 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 you know, free free markets and free trade. That's all a thing of the past, and never to return. Thank goodness. And then, of course, two years later, we had the Great Depression. Um, we had the stock market crash of 1929, 1929, then it was over. So, and and that was it. You know, f full scale plunge into. Um, 
plan in central command all over the developed world. So here Mises was prescient. I mean, he wrote a book trying to elevate and, and talk about the importance of the foundations of liberalism. So why do I think it's important to go back to this? And see if I can explain this well. I think to return to my earlier theme, the liberalism as a, uh, as a, as a difficult and abstract uh, uh, ideology that requires a, a high level of intelligence and calmness of mind, um, it's difficult to maintain. We are all buffeted around by politics. We're all influenced by personalities and the uh, daily headlines. And so that even those of us who love liberties, uh, certainly uh, libertarians, what we call libertarians at our time, uh, get, get, get caught up in the enemy of the day and tend to rally around anybody who opposes the enemy of the day. Rather than thinking broadly and, and thinking rationally, we sometimes get, get overly caught up in um, wanting to see the enemies of liberty killed through the political process. And so that's why I think it's important for the, that this book not just be read, but be read like once a year, because it recenters you on what the important uh, things are in the world, the, the, the institutions that really constitute liberal policy. And I want to go through those one by one. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about the latest controversies involving Trump. And so um, just by way of background here, um, I think that I am pretty much like most, most libertarians in the world in the sense that I've generally thought of the key enemies of liberty as coming from the left. Uh, and I think, that's, that's, I think that that's generally been true for the most part in US history, although even that, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But, uh, you know, and part of the reason for that is, I mean, so we're very, we're very attuned to the evil of socialism. And we recognize uh, uh, the left as being a, a problem. Our college professors drove us crazy, uh, left-wing activists calling for, uh, for, for higher taxes and regulations on everything. Their complete economic ignorance drives us out of our minds. So we're always focused on this, and it drives us it drives us absolutely crazy. The problem with this perspective, not that there's anything wrong with it as such, but it can blind us to a danger that can emerge from the right that we're not really temperamentally um, or intellectually prepared to resist because we don't we don't recognize it as as such. I think I've always been more or less in that um, in that boat, you know I mean, Sometimes people will dismiss right wing uh, right wing ideologues and say, um, "Well, yeah, it's true that he's for war. Yes, it's true that he's for you know controls on uh, on on drugs. It's true that he wants limits on free speech. He wants surveillance. Uh, he seems to be uh, sympathetic to the police state, but at least he wants free enterprise, you know." Or another thing that you'll sometimes hear is, uh, "Yeah, well." Uh, whatever whatever's wrong with politician so and so, at least at least he opposes my left wing politicians that I, that I can't stand that much. So therefore, you know the left is a greater threat. So I'll always rally around the right. By the way, this is not just Americans. I mean, this is true in the twenties and thirties in Europe. Many liberals of the type that I, I'm I'm heralding tonight similarly um, saw such a danger associated with communism that they developed a kind of temperamental, uh, temperamentally, uh, uh, comparatively uh, tolerant attitude towards right-wing figures who oppose the left. So, yeah, there may be, you know, Franco may have his problems, he may be murdering his political enemies, he may want, you know, a, a state church or whatever, but at least he's not a communist, you know, and that was the same thing about Mussolini. And so on, and 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 it was even true of Hitler in Germany. You know, whatever is wrong with him, he, he hates the communists. Uh, to some extent, it was even true in the U.S. with with uh, with with FDR. You know, he wasn't a communist. He was going to at least save the system from socialism, and and a lot of people acquiesced to uh, really a, a despotic intervention of state, uh, just because they figured it was a, a better solution than than communism. It's just true. So, I mean, by taking, by, by accepting the lesser of two evils, uh, sometimes we become an actual accomplices and bringing about an, uh, you know, an actual evil rather than an evil that we've never seen. 
and that maybe was never a threat to begin with. In any case, there's a sense in which I think uh, libertarians uh, and now are just not attuned to dangers from the right. Uh, we don't recognize it. We don't have a name for it. Fascism, we believe, has been vanquished from the world. Um, surely that was all over in World War II. We got rid of, of all those uh, blustering, uh, str strutting, boisterous military uh, uh, strongmen. Got rid of every. Got rid of all those guys. So surely um, fascism is is no longer a danger. But you know. What's interesting about that is that, well, the first place is completely wrong. There's a reason in history why fascism came about. It, it wasn't just an ideology invented um, in the 1920s that uh, you know that had its that had its day and went away. It's a persistent political impulse within the nature of the human person. Uh, otherwise, it never would have succeeded. I mean, we need to study the reasons it succeeded and be alert to them. For my own part, um, yes, I've, you know, it's, it's something of a cliche to say that, you know, libertarians are neither left nor right. I mean, it's true, and we say it, but do we really believe it? I mean, think about the way the things have, have, have emerged in the US uh, political world. Um, on the left, you have a, a whole array of, 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 of objectionable uh, policies. Um, that would impoverish us all. We know this. And then on the right, you have uh, a weird accumulation of ideological forces that most of us think is just kind of an accident of history. But actually, if you look at the history of fascism, it's not so accidental. I mean, so on the right, within the Republican coalition, so to speak, um, you have, yes, an interest in, in free enterprise that's mostly driven by a kind of a merchant class. And then you have the religious right, you know, which emerged in the 1980s, sort of rolled in to, to the fabric of, 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 of the Republicans. And then you have uh, the, the militarist uh, wing uh, that defends the, uh, the, the Pentagon and U.S. imperial interests combined with their sort of corporate backers um, and a very, very strong and powerful uh, wing of the Republican Party. I hadn't entirely realized just how powerful it was until I saw Rand Paul, who's always been something of a, uh, you know, better than most. I mean, his writings on the subject are, are pretty good on foreign policy. I mean, he's relatively for peace. He wants to withdraw troops from around the world. You know, he doesn't want uh, colonial empires. Uh, 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 he wants the U.S. to be a regular, peaceful, commercial republic. But to see him hammered and hammered and hammered and told that he could never go anywhere within the Republican Party until he fixed this problem that he has, which is which is favoring peace and opposing war, and to see him slowly step back from that position, um, with the under the presumption that he could never get the nomination unless unless he unless he did that. And I don't want to attribute you know entirely cynical motives to him. I, I think he probably was sincere about about the the views he held on Iran and and, and other things, but. Nonetheless, I, I think it is a measure of what kind of pressures he faced within the Republican Party, very powerful part of the coalition. So, um, and then increasingly in the US as part of this coalition of the Republicans, we have a, uh, a racial element because the demographics of voting are uh, widely recognized as fairly predictable with, uh, uh, women being less supportive of Republicans and being sort of split down the middle, um, you know, in terms of in terms of either party, Hispanics always going to the Democrats, uh, Black Americans always voting for the Democrats, uh, new immigrants always voting for the for the for the for the Democrats, causing therefore Republicans to be kind of become this party of right of um, white males, you know, as as the as the, as the core reliable voting block. And I'm not saying anything controversial here. This is all just Part of the demographics of, of party structure. So there, so there you have it. You know, within the Republicans, you know, um, uh, social con social conservatives with a with a with a with a strong religious cultural bent, uh, um, militarized uh, uh, defenders of the uh, emergence of death, and a, a global military empire and war, and then you have. The, the class of, of merchants that favor deregulation and uh, free enterprise. 
So if libertarians are going to favor one or the other, we look at we look we look at the Demo at the Democrats and say, well, okay, maybe there's a few good policies going on there, but you know they represent a fundamental threat to prosperity itself. At least on the Republican side, you've got a, a you know a, a certain a certain amount of intelligence in in the economic realm operating. So we become uh, we become I, I think temperamentally uh, less alarmed. At, at, at dangers from the right. And it's, you know, the thing is in politics, there's a thing that you, you, become, you become sanguine about, the thing that you think can never happen, the, the, the threat that you, you put on the shelf and stop worrying about. That's the very thing that surprises you. That's the thing that comes in and bites you, you know? That's the snake that, that drops down from the tree and, and seizes on your neck, you know? That's the way it always is. So we shouldn't be we shouldn't be casual about this. The threat from the to that that the right wing represents to liberty. And in saying this again, I'm I'm critical of myself because you know that's a little bit of my history. I've my own personal history is you know I've having been very sympathetic to Reagan very late in the Reagan administration. I I, I had a moment where I I was overwhelmed at just what a, what a what a betrayal. Um, the Republican Party and the Reagans, Reaganites were, were about, and I became very sympathetic to the left, especially once my full scale, scale conversion to foreign policy of foreign policy of peace took place. I became much more um, uh, non-rightist in that sense, and I, I persisted um, ever since. But but still, even even in the words I chose, like Reagan betrayed us. Okay, we we just are sort of naturally tending to think of us versus them. Us meaning that we were part of that coalition and he betrayed us. So you see what I mean? Libertarians sort of naturally always like to think of themselves as, as, as belonging more to the right than to the left. And it really wasn't until I heard, um, well, I mean, my frustration with certain aspects of the nativism of, of the right and the intolerance and that sort of thing has been building for some years. But it wasn't until I heard Trump speak at Freedom Fest um, uh, this summer that I kind of put it all together in my mind. And what, what tipped me off was, was, was his single-minded focus during his hour-long rambling speech on trade as being the great evil, the thing that that we had to we had to put a stop to. We had to create create uh, trade wars. Uh, we, the United States, had to get tough with other countries that are robbing us. You know, um, China. You know, with its trade policy, Mexico with the immigration policies. Um, uh, you know, every other country you can possibly think of. I mean, Donald Trump uh, was just very very anxious for war. It was a, it was a fascinating thing to hear because. The truth is we don't have an immigration crisis, like at all. Immigration is practically prohibited into this country. I mean, if you're a foreigner who wants to come here and live and work and open a business, forget it. It's just not gonna happen. I mean, it's, it's, we, we live under a state, a state of prohibition of immigration, unlike anything we've seen in the whole of US history, which has always been a, a country of free migration from its very inception. We didn't, we, we didn't have any, any kind of national uh, immigration controls into the late 19th century. You know, when with with when we, there was a big attack and target on the Chinese, it was then until the 1920s where specific eugenics policies started prohibiting immigration and limiting it to a certain number of basically white people. You know, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm just describing here. Okay, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying this is what happened. It was an overtly eugenics um, immigration policy. Um, I mean, but so now, um, uh, you know, through a series of legislation over the over the course of, especially certainly since nine eleven, um, we have a practical prohibition of of immigration in this country. So it's you know it's no wonder we have so many illegal we have eleven million illegal immigrants in this country because it's not possible for them to be legal. This is what happens when you make things illegal. Um, when you make th make it impossible for people to do things. Legally, they will do things illegally, okay? But even by, by judging by the polls, there is no immigration crisis whatsoever. Uh, there's l less public, at least until Trump came along, there's less public concern about immigration than there's been in, in, in any time on record. 
And we can look under the, on the polling data and see that. People are just not concerned about it. It's just not been on the radar screen. But Trump managed to whip up a frenzy. And similarly with trade with China, I mean, there is no problems with trade with China. I mean, if this were the, the, the great textile and steel wars of the, 18, uh, of the 1980s and 1990s, where, where places like Pittsburgh were being completely gutted, you know, where the deep south was, you know, where, where textile plants were closing all over the place, you know, when the world was going... Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, when the world was going into massive upheaval, there, there might have been one thing to have raised alarm bells about about China. You know, it's still unjustified. But nowadays, we've we've got peace, and every every American benefits massively from trade with China. So to, here's Trump standing up in front of a group of of right wing Republicans, and with unbelievable power and you know demagogic presence and persistence and confidence asserting that we're being invaded from the South by people and from China by goods and whipping everybody up into the frenzy. And that's true that maybe 10 or 20% of the audience was persuaded by this and, and most everybody else was like kind of grossed out by it. But sure enough, it was just a harbinger of things to come. I mean, over the coming weeks, this guy rose 20, 20% uh, and 25% and 30% um, to, to dominate that that percentage of Republican votes, and now it's gotten so extreme that he's very nearly the presumptive nominee. I mean, that's what's happening out there right now, to the point that people are actually making deals with him. You know, chairman of the Republican National Committee. Uh, there's already talk about what his cabinet is going to be. Uh, Sarah Palin is going to be in charge of energy policy, and so on. I mean, that's how quickly it's all happening. Well, it was incredibly. I mean, you know. Listening to that Trump speech, I couldn't help but my mind just drifted back to omnipotent government, right? Mises' book from 1944, which was you know the most anti-Nazi, anti-fascist book ever written, a huge book on the subject. It was very, very interesting. 100% attack on the brown shirts as being the central threat to civilization. It represents something of a little bit of a change, right? So in 1922, he's like all about the Reds. You know, don't let the Reds destroy civilization. 1944 comes along, and it's and it's all about the Browns. Look, look at they look what they're doing. And you understand the difference between the two, right? It's mainly a, a presentation, a cultural thing. But Mises opens his book, 1944, uh, Independent Government, with a massive attack on on Nazi trade policies, which he says the central core of Nazism. At least from a from a political propagandistic point of view, point of view, was not down with the Jews or even up with the Germans. Um, it was we need more breathing room for Germany to thrive. Down with the foreigners. They're robbing us. They're pillaging us. Uh, he used the the rough piece of, of Versailles to kind of uh, and people's distrust of economic structures, global economic structures, to whip up a kind of a, a, a nationalist frenzy. It was all about trade. And migration uh, were being invaded by foreign goods and by foreign peoples, and this was the whole basis for the for the for his rise. The the anti-Semitism and racial stuff was always hinted at, but it was never overt until later. And I couldn't help but just think about this the whole time I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, you know, this is what fascism sounds like. This is what it this is what it feels like. It's a a, a frenzy that draws on people's sense of identity and a perception of, of foreign threats to whip them up into uh, supporting essentially a strong man. And, and that he would be a strong man, there's absolutely no doubt. I mean, this is a guy who stood up and said that under his administration, he would absolutely forbid any country, any, any U.S. corporation from opening a factory overseas. So he's going to call up Ford Motor Company, who has a deal with Mexico, and tell them, no, you can't do that, right? Forget Congress, forget the Supreme Court, forget, you know, uh, U.S. trade uh, negotiators and all the rest of it, you know, uh, uh, or any uh, any uh, uh, and and forget the the desires of the property owner, owners and the stockholders themselves. He and he alone will decide what happens to your property, where it goes. Now, this is this is a very this is this is a fascistic, nationalistic, you know, sort of dictatorial sort of mentality. Imagine himself to be the CEO of a country. We've, in my lifetime, we've never seen anything like it. You know, 
I've written a series of articles on this topic, and I've been uh, I've been attacked for a whole variety of re reasons. It's, it's very interesting. I want to address some of those attacks right now, but um, uh, you know, when you reflect on on just how bad things are in this country, you know, deep, deeply corrupt, uh, you know, pillaging tax state, you know, highly regulated. I just got back from the Northeast, and I saw what the intervention of state has done to that poor place. I mean. Uh, the amount of impoverishment in upstate New York is is overwhelming. It doesn't look like there's been a, a, a bit of economic growth uh, in, in upstate New York in the last 25 years. I mean, the whole place just seems like it's decaying. I mean, it's far different from the South, you know, um, in that sense. It's just, it's a real mess. And I, I, I can see the frustration. I see why people loathe the, the current uh, system. Uh, you know, but as I was listening to Trump, I, I, I realized for probably the first, first time in my life, Things could not just get worse. Things could get much worse. Um, and and there's no sense in pretending otherwise. Uh, Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek, uh, 1944, I believe, same same year as uh, omnipotent government. Again, a warning against the brown shirts. And he opens it up by saying, you know, the revelations of the brutalities of the of the Nazis and the fascists have been uh, so shocking to us that we 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 use those revelations to flatter ourselves and say, oh, well, something like that could never happen here. But he, he cautions. He says, you know, in the ten years before uh, before uh, uh, Hitler's rise in Germany, nobody ever could have imagined it would happen in Germany either. So there's no use for there's there's really no room for 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 uh, for, for for ignoring the threat. Um, Things can always get worse. And as I listened to Trump, I thought, my God, you know, um, I've lived throughout a long period of political decline in the US. Uh, politics always seems to be getting worse. Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, a great flourishing of technology and progress in, in the digital realm that's, that's seems to be on its way to watering down political structures and making them less and less relevant. A guy like Trump, could actually reverse that trend in, in, a, in a major and wicked way. So I wrote a series of articles about this. And just, you know, out of nowhere, I mean, it's been it's just such a shock to me. I've been introduced into a realm of the internet that I did not, I guess I always knew existed, but I didn't realize just how gigantic it is. Uh, suddenly I'm being attacked, you know, uh, uh, tweeted at and Facebook and all, all the rest of it by a whole assembly of, of, uh, of wackos who accept basically fascistic style doctrine. So, you know, you have a, a, a long list of people that, that the left has always sort of said existed, which I too frequently just dismissed as being like, well, that's just left wing paranoia. You know, dedicated uh, white supremacists and, and white nationalists, which I guess are slightly. Uh, yeah, so I'm just noticing that I've used all my data for this connection. Unbelievable. Uh, my apologies. I hope I don't get cut off. Um, this is why I said I was on an unusual connection. But so you've got the white racialists, the white supremacists, and I guess there's a difference between the two. I can hardly keep up with it. Um, then you've got, you know, overt and dedicated anti Semites, you know, which is it, very strange. I mean, because they're. You know, they'll post, you know, you know Jewish, anti-Jewish conspiracy theories all up and down their Twitter account. Yet if you call them an anti-Semite, they resent it. You know, <laughs> these are people who use Nazi-era caricatures of Jews as their profile pics. And if you, and if you say they're an anti-Semite, they, they, they get upset with you, you know. Then, um, of course, you've got the, the wild protectionists uh, 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 and mercantilists out there. Um, and, and along with it comes a whole range of sort of rightist attitudes uh, on everything. Some of them not entirely without merit. I mentioned men's rights in one of, in one of, my, um, in one of my columns. I threw it in there because I, you know, I see this. You, know, you go to the men's rights groups and their accounts and, and sure enough, they're linked uh, to, the, to the white nationalists. Um, you know, dedicated anti-feminists and the white white nationalists, and then the anti-Semites and the Holocaust revisionists, and I mean, you just go through the xenophobes, and it's just amazing. You don't have, only have to dig a little bit under the surface, and you and you find this 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 huge world. Um, and again, you might be listening to me say, "Oh, don't be so paranoid. These people are irrelevant." Well, not so much, actually. 
you, you know, the, the two popular uh, what, Nazi websites on, on the internet are both more popular than either the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute in terms of overall traffic. Uh, this is huge. So I began, I pointed this out in a column a couple of days ago. And then, you know, once again, I'm just slammed with, um, with uh, you know, I got on their mailing list and I got, and I, I got targeted by these people. And, and you know, I've been having to ban accounts like, like a, like a part-time job, you know, <laughs> and it's fascinating to me. And, and even some libertarians have said, well, you know, aren't you getting carried away with this? Again, I, to me, it's, to me, it's proof that we're, we are, we are, as libertarians, we're, we're very sensitive to the threats from the left, but we don't even recognize that there is a fascistic right, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, and what it leads to. Um, because we don't have an intellectual apparatus to oppose it. Um, we're not temperamentally disposed to recognizing it as a threat. It's just true. At least that, that's my impression that it's true. Um, what I'd like to see is a libertarianism that is not just anti-right, it's not just anti-left, but is also anti-right. Uh, they're equally aware of the threats from, from all sides. But I think more importantly than that, has a real solid core of understanding about what it is that we believe and that we develop kind of instincts to be able to smell a rat you know, to be able to discern anti-liberal attitudes out there when we hear them and call them for what they are, whether they're from the left or from the right, and stop making deals, uh, uh, intellectual deals with ourselves and with others that says, well, actually right now the left is more of a threat than the right, so let's support the right against the left, or the, the right is more of a threat than the left, so let's support the left against the right. I mean, we need to stop doing this um, because it's actually dangerous. I mean, whatever, whatever we tend to support, we're, we're, going to, we're going to look back at it and go, what was I thinking? You know, I underestimated the threat of, this one, the, of the side I supported. Um, I was too strategic in my, in my outlook. I mean, and I think the only way we can really do that, we can get to that point where we have a, a, a good solid core and have the ability to recognize threats from wherever they may be, is to recenter ourselves. And when I say recenter ourselves, I don't mean something like adopt um, a simplistic and tiny um, ethical doctrine that we ex expect we're going to apply, apply over the world. I mean, um, I think the non-aggression principle is a, a very nice principle. I mean, my mentor, Murray Rothbard, uh, wrote about it in chapter two of, of uh, uh, For New Liberty, and I think it's a really good rule of thumb. It, but it's preposterous to think that just saying those words, non-aggression principle, are going to solve all problems. I mean, these are just words. People don't even agree on the definition of what ag aggression is. Um, and we can find ourselves, in, you know, and people who assert NAP, you know, uber alis, uh, themselves don't always agree on what it implies for things like uh, intellectual property and a whole host of areas. I mean, it's preposterous to think that, that reducing the whole of liberalism to one little statement is enough to solve all the theoretical uh, uh, difficulties associated with politics and economics. I mean, it's just, it's absurd. It's a, maybe it's a nice uh, summary statement, but we have to unpack it and understand the broad principles. If you look at a book like Liberalism, um, uh, largely written from a consequentialist point of view, what you find is, is a laying out of a beautiful temperament of what it means to be a liberal. The things that we favor, the things that we love, and how we're going to get there. Uh, that's why I think it's important that we read the book. It's not enough just to be against things, to be against the red shirts. That's not enough, all right? That's not enough to save civilization, to be against the red shirts. You also have to understand the threat from the right, which in, in real terms, at least in my way of thinking, has always been, looking back historically, always been a much more prescient threat in the developed world than red socialism ever was but because we're not inclined to see it, um, uh, we tend to acquiesce to it a little more easily. We should stop doing that. Now is the time. Now is the time. There's never been a, a, a brown shirted threat in America as intense in our lifetimes as it is right now. You can see it developing. 
you know, decline in the economy, middle class not having gained anything in wages in, in 25 years, maybe 40 according to some demographics, political corruption rampant, an establishment that everybody's sick of, uh, uh, a political oligarchy that, for God's sake, keeps going by the same names, Clinton Bush, Clinton Bush, Clinton Bush, are we going to do this again? Um, that level of, of political corruption and insider dealing, the cronyism, the bailouts, uh, the, the wars, I mean, people are fed up with it. You know, these are the conditions that give rise to people having a nihilistic view. Damn it, I'm sick of it. Let's get a strong man in there, and especially a strong man that adopts my values, my religion, uh, my race. What are his policies? Who knows? Who cares? He's for me. Let's put him in charge. This is the way dictators come to power. And if we're not alert to this right now, uh, uh, I mean, it depends on you and me. If if we don't sound the alarm and and explain this in, in however many ways we possibly can, uh, we may miss a real opportunity to do some real good in this world. Um, I wish that every, every person listening to me right now would put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, whatever, and write about the subject and explain it to your colleagues. Fascism is real. It's a threat what it looks like, what it feels like, what its cultural import is, how it's trying to manipulate people to take the things they love, family, religion, property, their race, their people, their nation, to grab all that organic matter of society and throw it into a very nasty brew that leads to political dictatorships. It is manipulation. And it is very, very dangerous precisely because it can succeed politically. Never forget that the masses as voters are extremely stupid. The ignorance is, is appalling. The same people who can do brilliantly in the marketplace, spending their own money, rewarding fabulous fast foods, you know, knowing what to buy at Amazon, um, uh, starting great new businesses. When people are dealing with their own property, they make wonderful rational decisions. When they're not dealing with their own property and they're making decisions for a whole nation, they cling to irrational and evil uh, impulses. You can destroy society through voting. Um, in the political marketplace, you can save the world by voting in the economic marketplace. There's a big difference between the two. Um, this, is the, this is the time, my friends, when democracy becomes uh, not just corrupt, and not just pillaging, you know, but but fundamentally dangerous to our way of life. And the only way you can come to recognize this is by understanding liberalism. I have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to burn through this book really, really quickly. 1927, the last statement of an old doctrine, old doctrine of classical liberalism, came about during a difficult time. Uh, of, of, of the rise of socialisms and the threats of fascism. Mises wanted to make a statement that recalled a dream and kept uh, that dream alive for better times. For Mises, liberalism is a temperament. It's an outlook. It's an ambition for world peace and prosperity. It's not a syllogism or universal ethical principle. It's a, it's a temperament, an outlook. And this book captures that. And it helps keeping us buffeted from being uh, you know, uh, overly involved in the latest political frenzy and being aware of threats when they do come along. So what are the foundations of liberalism? Let me just enumerate these as I've teased them out from this book. First of all, private property is the core of liberalism. This was what classical liberalism got very, very well that liberalism as it developed throughout the late 19th century tended to forget. Uh, that private property is the foundation for everything else. Without private property, you can't have uh, free speech, um, you can't have freedom of religion, you can't have any other uh, uh, any other kinds of freedoms. It's the foundation of, of everything. Private property is necessary because of the existence of scarcity in the world. It's the way that we've learned to resolve disputes over who owns and controls what. Secondly, peace. There's no civilization without peace. Anybody who advocates war is is an absolute enemy of, of liberalism and, and all of its and all of its uh, uh, manifestations. Without peace, uh, there can be no hope for civilization at all. Number three, tolerance. 
tolerance. I like this section on tolerance because Mises, Mises rightly understands that tolerance was the beginning of liberalism. By tolerance, he means primarily religious tolerance. You know, there was a time, uh, well, from the ancient world, essentially, all the way up through the Enlightenment, when it seemed inconceivable you could ever have a society where pre people freely and equally held rights to have their own religious religious ideas. Um, it, it seemed that um, it, it seemed it seemed like an, an impossible thing. You know, you, you would just have chaos, wouldn't you? If, with uh, with with freedom of religion, people just uh, you know believing whatever they wanted. And with the idea of tolerance came this first idea uh, with this first notion that, hey, um, actually it doesn't matter that much. People can actually hold in good conscience many different points of view and get along and actually cooperate beautifully. As a matter of fact, if you look back at the birth of modernity, um, I like to think of uh, medieval Spain as essentially the birthplace of, of modernity, uh, where you had uh, a, a beautiful co coexistence between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, each of which fed into the other and 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 helped and, and christianity drew things from judaism and and uh islam drew things from christianity and so on and on around and around and around it went until you actually saw uh, the 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 beginnings of the birth of, of the very notion of, of progress through this mixing of ideas mixing of religions that it comes about only through tolerance so for me this tolerance is a central uh, principle of um of, uh, uh, of liberalism, and it's not possible to embrace liberalism while maintaining uh, intolerance towards other people's uh, lifestyles, perspective, religions, um, wishes, and ambitions for their, for their own lives. We're not equal. Um, thank God we're not. We're all very, very different. But to get along and to have the kind of liberty that leads to a, a building of a burgeoning and flourishing civilization, we have to learn to tolerate uh, views that are different from, from our own. Uh, number four is self-determination. I really like this, this idea. Um, uh, the idea is that if a people that, that uh, it's connected with democracy. In fact, it's not possible to separate democracy and, and self-determination. If, if a people don't want to be ruled by, uh, uh, by a centralized political power that they feel is foreign to them, they should uh, feel free to establish their own government and go their own way. Uh, ever more small self-determining political units are the way forward within the context of, of global free trade. Mises goes so far in this book as to celebrate the idea of secessionism, again, a, a central liberal uh, principle. If you don't want to be part of this regime, you should be able to leave. And uh, Mises even goes so far as to say, not in this book, but in a, a 1919 book, that if it were possible to reduce this the idea of self-determination all the way down to the individual level, um, then it should be done. Um, and finally, free trade. By the way, I left out limited government, although for Mises, Mises was not an anarchist. And, you know, you read him, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to why he was. He wasn't an anarchist because he was terrified of the idea that without a government, it would just it would just be a war of all against all, and that the gangs the gangs would rule the world, uh, and the private property would not be protected, that peace would give way to war, and everything would be uh, worse. So the purpose of government is to stop uh, that kind of conflict, to guarantee private property rights, to guarantee peace, keep money sound, and keep fanatics from taking over society. Uh, look, I don't agree with this. I think this is actually incorrect, although. I mean, I understand what he's saying. I get this. He wanted government. He lo loved liberty so much that he wanted government to have, uh, to be able to provide something of a bulwark of a guarantee of, uh, of universal rights, private property, peace, and tolerance. I get that. I understand it. I, I don't think it's the right means. I think we've advanced beyond that. Although um, it's not possible to read means does not understand what he, what he means by this. Finally, free trade. Uh, uh, capital and labor have to have their highest valued uses. If either capital or labor are, are held and imprisoned a situation, 
um, they come to be undervalued in some places and overvalued in other places. And this leads to uh, a growing conflict. This is why protectionism always leads eventually to war and why migration controls are essentially unsustainable. Um, but keep in mind, when Mises uses the word free trade, he doesn't just mean with goods. He doesn't mean just services. He means the free migration of all peoples all over the world. Um, I'm going on Stalso next week to argue for open borders uh, for the U.S. Um, Mises thinks it's a no-brainer in this country. Of course, you should let anybody who wants to come here to work, to live, to start a business, uh, come here. And it'll work just like any other economic. The, the ebbs and flows of who comes and who goes works according to economic principles, just as with, with capital. Um, you know, I, th I think a, a, the practical elimination of borders around the world would be the, would be the right way. Uh, you know, and it's funny to me that just saying that, it sounds like an outrageous um, idea. But I was just talking to my brother over the weekend. I said, uh, I said to him, I said, do you remember when we were kids? We could just drive across the Mexican border. And he said, oh, yeah, sure. We did it all the time. Every time guests would, would uh, come because they're from uh, West Texas. When guests would come to town, they'd say, let's go to Juarez. So we'd say, okay. And we'd get in the car and drive. And we'd say, welcome to Mexico. And we'd buy, you know, anything and everything. Um, my brother and I would often buy knives. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable to think of this. Bring them back across the border. There's never any checks. It's, you know, there, maybe there was a guy waving at you, uh, but that was about it. And then we'd sell them, you know, to other kids in school, you know, and, and every kid in school carried knives. Um, it was not a bad world. I know this sounds outrageous. I mean, you're hearing this going, that, you know, how could this possibly be true? It's true. We had complete freedom of, of movement in those days. Um, and now it's just inconceivable. There were no passports necessary, you know. And that was just the U.S. and Mexico. In my lifetime, we, we had a practical migration of people. Now... We have to distinguish between migration of people and citizenship rights. And this is one of the great problems we have today. Anytime the subject of immigration comes up, people want to talk about who can and cannot be a citizen. Um, and this is what freaks people out, you know? Uh, we're going to let everybody, you know, everybody from, from all over Latin, all over Central, uh, Central and Latin, you know, Mexico and Central America and Latin America. Uh, come here and become citizens? You know, won't that fundamentally change the political character of our country? Well, this is not what we're talking about. We have to come up with ways to somehow decouple the right to work and migrate and live and be enterprising in an economic way from citizenship. Uh, the, these are There's no necessary connection between the two. And for whatever reason in this country, we've come to the place where we, we pretty much prohibit um, migration in that old sense that Mises talks about it, freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of, of peoples uh, and labor. Uh, we've got to untie that from, um, from uh, becoming a citizen of the country. I mean, that's just, that should not be the point. And, and that's not the reason why people come here. Do you think people come here to vote? I mean, the Democrats might want them to, you know, but that's not why people come. People come here to have a good life. That's the that's the goal. And I don't know about you, but I don't consider my right to vote to be as the essence of the way I, my good life, you know, is is protected. I mean, that's that's the least important thing. It's just it's a, a, a an irrelevant thing, you know. Once every four years to go into go behind a curtain and 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 vote for for Joe or Jane. I mean that's that's not that's not why people move to the U.S. People want to come here so they can live and work and contribute to our well-being as consumers, as producers, as taxpayers, if if you want. Uh, but just as 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 human beings. And if you deny that, if you are uh, uh, an anti-immigrationist in that sense in which I'm describing it, um, you can't possibly call yourself a liberal, or much less a libertarian. It, it's just not part of our tradition. Mises makes it very, very clear. I'm sorry, I'm going to go over just a little bit. Um, now, Mises does discuss the the different the um, exceptions. In case of Australia, for example, he says if Australia had free immigration, it would, would quickly become a, a a completely Asian country. 
you know, uh, uh, Chinese and, and uh, uh, ethnicities that were yet non-European. He said, this, this terrifies people. There's nothing more horrible uh, for a domestic population, especially one that believes it has inherited some sort of cultural rights over a region, to be ruled by a majority that are not, that don't share their ethnicity and religion. And he, he, Mises says, I, I totally get this, I understand this. But he says, understand that the only reason this is a fear is because of interventionist economic policies. If we didn't have uh, large governments that you could control, there would be no problem with anybody moving anywhere and even uh, you know, with, with full citizenship rights. So it says this is a result of, 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 uh, um, of interventionist policies that have created large governments. He makes no reference to the welfare state, by the way. There really wasn't that much of a big welfare state, of course, in 1927. There was the beginning of this one. But it's it's the democratic control of big governments that make migration a problem. All right, I'm I want to read the last section of liberalism here. All right, let me let me just quickly check the chat window now. <laughs> okay, all sorts of fun comments. Okay. Um, yeah, liberalism is not on fee. You have to get it on Mises Org. Uh, you just yeah, you can just you just download it real quick. Quick EPUB. I put it up there. Um, I'm keeping going. Okay, all right. I'm finished. Thank you for all the nice comments. That's great. Okay, let me uh, let me just bump to the end here because I just feel like I need to read this for you before we close out the evening because I just think it's so beautiful. It's the last chapter, the future of liberalism. Um, now our civilization is beginning. Oh, yeah, also uh, liberalism is on liberty.me. You should, uh, as a member of the site, you should just get it there along with every other book. We have the best library uh, available you can possibly imagine. Um, I think we also also the most up to the edition probably has an introduction by me. Now our civilization is beginning to scent a whiff of death in the air, he says. Dilettantes loudly proclaim that all civilizations, including our own, must perish. This is an, ex an inexorable law. Europe's final hour has come, warn these prophets of doom, and they find credence. An autumnal mood is perceptibly beginning to set in everywhere. But modern civilization will not perish unless it does so by its own act of self-destruction. No enemy can destroy it the way the Spaniards once destroyed the civilization of the Aztecs, for no one on earth can match his strength against the standard bearers of modern civilization. Only internal enemies can threaten it. I mean, that's Mises' point. Forget these guys like Trump. Oh, the enemies are the Chinese, they're the Mexicans, the rapists, the killers, they're, they're pillaging. No, only internal enemies can destroy the U.S. They can come to an end only if the ideas of liberalism are supplanted by an anti-liberal ideology hostile to social cooperation. People who preach war between groups are not friends of liberty period, whether that comes from the left or the right. If somebody is preaching conflict, war, struggle, and an inherent antagonism of interest between peoples, he or she is not a friend of liberty. They're trying to manipulate you. There has to be a growing realization that material progress is possible only in a liberal capitalist society. If this point is not expressly conceded by the anti-liberal, is fully acknowledged indirectly. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to go on now, um, because I want I just have to read this end. It is often maintained that what divides present-day political parties is a basic opposition to their in their ultimate philosophical commitments that cannot be settled by rational argument. The discussion of these antagonisms must therefore necessarily prove fruitless. Each side will remain unshaken in its conviction because the latter is based on a comprehensive worldview and that cannot, cannot be altered by any considerations proposed by reason.
The ultimate ends toward which men strive are diverse. Hence, it is altogether out of the question that men aiming for these diverse ends could agree on a uniform procedure. Nothing is more absurd than this belief. Aside from the few consistent ascetics who seek to divest life of all of external trappings and finally succeed in attaining a state of renunciation of all desire and all action, indeed all, and indeed of self-annihilation, all men of the white race, however diverse um, may be their views on supernatural matters, agree in preferring a social system in which labor, yeah, poor Mises, right? But anyway, my apologies for uh, for that, what he means by white race, by the way, in 1927 is basically a European mindset. Um, a very easy opinion to hold in 1927, uh, by the way. Um, agree in preferring a social system which labor is more productive to one and which is, is less productive. Even those who believe that an ever progressing improvement in the satisfaction of men's wants does no good and that it would be better if we produce fewer material goods would not wish that the same amount of labor should result in fewer goods. At most, they would wish that there should be less labor and consequently less production, but not less of the same amount. In other words, everybody wants more. Everybody wants a better life. The political antagonisms of today are not controversies over ultimate questions of philosophy, but opposing answers to the question of how a goal that all acknowledge is legitimate can be achieved most quickly and with least sacrifice. This goal, which all men aim is the best possible satisfaction of human wants. It is prosperity. It is abundance. I'm not sure, sure that's true anymore, but it was certainly true in, in, in 1927. Again, the goal at which all people, men, aim is the best possible satisfaction of human wants. It is prosperity. It is abundance. Of course, this is not what all men aspire to, but it is all they can expect to attain by resort to external means and by way of social cooperation. The inner blessings, happiness, peace of mind, exaltation must be sought by each man within himself alone. Liberalism is no religion, no worldview, no party of special interests. It is no religion because it demands neither faith nor devotion, because there's nothing mystical about it, and because it's because it is, has no dogmas. It is not, not a worldview because it does not try to explain the cosmos, because it says nothing and does not seek to say anything about the meaning and purpose of human existence. It is not a party of special interests because it does not provide or seek to provide any special advantage whatsoever to any individual or group. It is something entirely different. It is an ideology, a doctrine of the mutual relationship among members of society, and at the same time, the application of this doctrine to the conduct of men in actual society. It promises nothing that exceeds what can be accomplished in society through society. It seeks to give men only one thing, the peaceful, undisturbed development of material well-being for all in order thereby to shield them from the external causes of pain and suffering, as far as it lies within the power of the social institutions to do it at all, to diminish suffering and to increase happiness. That is liberalism's aim. No sect and no political party has believed that it could afford to forego advancing its cause by appealing to men's senses. Rhetorical bombast, music and sound, banners wave, flowers and colors serve as symbols, and the leaders seek to attach their followers to their own person. Liberalism has nothing to do with all of this. It has no party flower, no party color, no party song, no party idols, no symbols, no slogans. It has the substance. It has the arguments, and these must lead it to victory. That's what Mises says, 1927. Amazing book. Thank you for being with me tonight. Um, it means so much to me that you've joined me. Um, we've got a difficult days ahead of us. Uh, I, I don't, 
Well, I was going to say, I don't mean to sound the alarm. I am sounding the alarm, okay? I am. I'm terrified of what's happening right now. We are making such progress, so much progress right now, technologically, in globalism, and global capitalism, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, engagement between individuals all over the world. Uh, things are, are growing. We're growing understandings between people. For God's sake, the language barriers are collapsing every day thanks to Google Translate. I'm able to communicate on Facebook with people from, from every religion. Uh, I mean, f from every language. It's, it's awesome what's happening. We, we're at the dawn of something fabulous. What could stop it? What could stop it are political demagogues that... Uh, that we're not prepared to understand. And as liberal, libertarians, we are not prepared to understand what the brown shirts look like, what they sound like, what they feel like. We're not prepared to understand their threat. Uh, we're temperamentally inclined to tolerate them to a greater extent than we are uh, people like Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. And, and that, I think, is a serious problem. Because in the end, we might find that the single greatest threat to liberty uh, in our times, uh, it comes from an unexpected source. It was true in the 1930s, and of all, of all things, in the 21st century, despite our technology, despite our peer-to-peer -peer communications, despite the fact that we live in a digital realm, you know, downloading applications every day and all the progress around us, we've got, you know, we've got, despite the collapse of, of so many interventionist systems, you know, monopolies falling every day, despite all of this, we've got in the 21st century, the rise of a terrifying threat that we are not prepared to meet intellectually. So yes, I am sounding the alarm. I think it's I think it's scary. It's scary not just because it's real, but because too few people recognize it. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, all the best to you, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Is in in uh, highly politicized times like ours is very difficult because you think about who are our opponents. You know. Um, on the one hand, on the left, uh, they don't think in terms of, of, of abstract ideals, of, of, the, of the good of good the whole, of uh, the long term. It's only about who can get what kind of material property right now from whom. Who has too much? Who has too little? Let's have a state that kind of resolves this problem, you know, gives, takes from one, gives to the other, uh, dealing with very concrete problems with very you know, sort of uh, concrete but ultimately violent solutions. Um, but it, but it's more immediate. It's it's something that penetrates the brain. I mean, quite frankly, it, it appeals to, to people without a lot of imagination. You know, um, uh, without a, a a sense of abstraction. You know, where people who don't bother to take the, above all don't take the time to learn anything about economics. Who, who can't juggle uh, uh, abstract thoughts in their head and can't follow down two steps of logic. You know, it's it's a it's a, a brutal and and um, uh, materialist philosophy of life that ju that just calculates you know according to who owns what and and how it can be better uh, better distributed essentially without a thought to production without a thought to the long term. Um, an extremely annoying and troubling point of view, but it's got a lot of advantages, as we can see today in the political world. People chase this doctor around. And look at, look at uh, Bernie Sanders and, and how popular he is, uh, just because he appeals to this very sort of base nature. On the other hand, you have the right, what I'm going to call the right, uh, that similarly uh, dispenses with, with uh, uh, big ideals of human flourishing, um, human well-being, uh, the welfare of all the long term. No, it's for the right. It's all about my religion, yeah? my blood, you know, my race, my people, my nation, uh, patriotism, uh, you know, military uh, victories, authority. Uh, who's doing the wrong thing and how can we get them to stop? How, who's doing the right thing and how can we reward them? Both of them, both left and right, right deal this way. This is the, their currency. So liberalism is is something different because it uh, I mean, like do we justly fear communism? Yes, absolutely. Is it communism actually a prospect? Actually, a possibility? Probably not. You know, um, it might 
it's been more real in, in, in uh, Mises' time in Europe than it, than it ever was in the U.S., but nonetheless, this was his main focus in 1922, that, that sort of um, uh, uh, collective ownership, common ownership or state ownership of, of all um, industry and uh, equalization of property. And along with, with that went a lot of really harebrained stuff from, 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 from the writings of Marx, you know, the great god of the time. Uh, such as uh, 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 the elimination of the family, the abolition of religion, as we know that Marx had a, just a, a wild uh, opposition to religion. And, um, you know, as a, as a thing that was inhibiting the, the advancement of communism in the world. And, um, you know, 100% uh, inheritance tax, and, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, centralized control of, of, of uh, uh, money, you know, just a kind of a, a, an egalitarianism that didn't seem to recognize the didn't didn't seem to didn't seem to recognize that there are certain things that people love in this world. I mean, one is their faith; the other is a property. You know, and and that freedom is to be valued. Uh, Marxism, as it, as it came to emerge in, in Europe, didn't have any regard for any of that stuff. So it was a, a terrifying ideology, and his book Socialism hammered it explaining that this is a system that couldn't work. In fact, what it would do is completely break down civilization as we know it. But, you know, this remained his focus. Um, in the mid middle of the 1920s, he wrote a book, Attacking Interventionism, which he regarded as being, um, you know, a system of, of, of control, mainly price control, wage control, administrative edicts that were coming down from, from states all over the world to uh, interfere in people's freedom to, to trade. Not socialism as such, but what he called interventionism, which is alive everywhere in the world. Everything from the manipulation of money and credit um, to um, uh, speech controls and, and wage controls and price controls, um, regulatory interventions, creation of cart business cartels, um, not socialism as such, um, but interventionism. At that point in history, it didn't really have a name. There were things like Nazi parties and, and uh, that sort of thing in, in Germany, but uh, they had not yet achieved any kind of political success. But that was that was to come a little bit later. Um, by 1927, it became obvious to Mises that things were uh, in, in a meltdown, uh, especially in Europe. You know, we'd already seen the great German inflation. Uh, there are two great com competitors for for political control rising in Europe: the socialists on the one hand, uh, the fascists on the other. Uh, uh, you can call them the red shirts versus the brown shirts. Both of them socialists of sort, but um, one uh, accepting the the old left wing creed, you know, of the abolition of the, of the family, which is a fundamental attack on on religion going on there, uh, a, a rampant egalitarianism that aspired for um, equalization of, 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 of results, you know, and, and property and that sort of thing. The right-wing version uh, took on a different cast, a different ideological structure. And it must have been between, somewhere between, um, when Mises finished his book, 19, uh, Socialism, 1922, and the writing of this book in 1927, which directly attacks fascism, as far as I can tell for the first time, um, that we started to see this ideology cohere. Uh, this brown shirted ideology go here, and and Mises has a, an explicit attack on it. You can turn to the chapterism here, and see that I, I I'm not aware of any other book that that makes such a a, a brutal attack on fascism this early. It's 1927, okay, and he names it. Um, he he calls it uh, uh, you know the appearance of of capitalism without the reality. Uh, uh, talks about just the inefficiencies associated with the creation of business, business cartels, um, migration controls, protectionism, trade protectionism was, was central. He says if, in this chapter on fascism that if fascism were to um, triumph, that civilization would be destroyed just as surely as it would be under socialism. He does add one caveat, and it's just one or two sentences. Okay, let's go ahead. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. I think this is a, an important evening I'd like to spend with you to talk about some fundamental issues. Uh, first of all, a good thing is I'm, you know, I'm a little better spirits than I was last week. I, I, well, I guess I missed last week. The week before, I had just gotten out of jail, so I was 
little, somebody commented on my video that I seemed a little bit down and uh, I don't know, I forget now what the word was, uh, uh, somber or something like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, so I'm not feeling that this way, the way that way this week. So um, it's good to be with you. Um, so tonight I want to talk about Mises' liberalism from 1927. Set up the 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 thesis, the idea, and I think most importantly, and it's not possible to read this book without understanding this, the historical context and what it says about Mises, and and his times, and in turn, what it says about us and our people who love liberty and the temperament that we should have. I'm getting a notification here, one moment. Okay, good, you can hear me all right. It's not the best connection, but it'll be fine for now. And, and in any case, what this book says about our attitude uh, towards the world. I'm not saying that I have it perfect, uh, you know, to be a liberal in all times and all places, a liberal meaning libertarian. Uh, I, I like the term liberal, by the way. I think, I think it's the right term for us, whether you're libertarian or limited government or <coughs> Minarchist, Hayeki, and, you know, Bastia guy, Thomas Jefferson, constitutionalist, doesn't matter. Uh, liberal is a particular thing. It's a particular set of ideals. It's a temperament. It's an outlook. It's an ambition. It's a dream. I think it's the right word, so I'm just going to continue to use the word liberal here tonight uh, to describe that. If we can defend that, I'll defend that some other time. <clears throat> but I think it's a real thing, and it's something we should aspire to. One of the reasons it's very difficult is that in so many ways, liberalism dwells, dwells in the realm of ideas. It's, it's an abstraction. It's not something you can see and touch. It's, it's, a, it's an ambition for the long term, for, for, for the whole community of humanity to thrive. Um, and to have that as an ideal uh, deals with, 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 with things that are, that are intangible, at least, um, at, least, at least for now. Um, we're dealing with, with, with a future unseen, with a, a kind of a peace unrealized, with a prosperity we're not experiencing, but which is possible under the right institutional circumstances. Liberalism, uh, at least in Mises' conception, is a result of, 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 a, of a more scientific uh, mind, a, a higher intelligence, a, uh, a, a getting rid of base considerations of faith and blood and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, who owns what and and how can we make it more, more fair like children it gets rid of all that so this is a problem for liberalism it always has been um in 1927 the world was going into upheaval you know in terms of mises's own intellectual development he had um uh his first book was on on money he wrote in in 1912. His second book was was uh, how war had changed uh, the landscape of, of 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 the world, the political landscape, the age of democracy, and what would be required. It was it was it was a, a tribute to liber uh, liberalism, but he took many aspects of liberalism for granted in that book. Um, then in 1922, he dealt with the what he saw as the fundamental threat to the world. Um, especially in light of the Bolshevik Revolution uh, and the rise of, of socialist movements all over Europe, and especially in academia, right? I mean, he's he's like working in Austria. Every single professor was like a socialist, you know, and that's what that's what sort of what they dealt with. That's what they did. So he wrote this book, Socialism, which is primarily an attack on on um, what today we call left socialism or, 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 or communism or left-wing ideology, essentially, um, which you saw as the primary threat to the world. I mean, and many in the U.S. would have agreed. In the 1920s, we saw the Red Scare. Uh, all over Europe, uh, there was tremendous terror and fear of, of, of communism coming, uh, doing to Europe what uh, the Bolsheviks did to Russia. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the threat was certainly exaggerated in the U.S., uh, there's a difference 